All right. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be back in Poland. It's my favorite European country, and it's always a pleasure to see Paolo and Agata and Anna and all my dear friends here. So I'm so glad. I'm so glad we made a decision to actually take a break so that now you're all very well caffeinated. Right? Yes? Wonderful. So uh, yesterday or two days back, I asked Paolo, what would you like me to talk about? Here are like five or six options. And his response was, this looks great. In other words, talk about everything. And so in the next uh, 40 minutes or 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about everything in the world. So as a quick introduction, I work at Lehigh University in the US. We are about 45 minutes from Philadelphia, about an hour, 15 minutes outside of uh, New York City. Uh, we are a university with about 5,000 undergraduate students, 2,300 grad students, and we have a very strong emphasis on, on, on entrepreneurship, on a global education, and on impact. And today I'm going to talk about uh, some of my work um, that is focused on impact. Uh, I run a number of different programs. I'm going to talk with just about a couple of them, but you can go to our website and learn about the others. Uh, but here is kind of the trajectory of my talk today. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some major global trends that we should be mindful of. I'm going to talk about this whole ethos of lifelong learning and specifically about how academia is changing and changing very quickly because that is one industry where there hasn't been a major disruption in the last few decades. I'm going to talk about, uh, or actually I'm going to show you a video clip, a 10 minute or so video clip on the Global Social Impact Fellowship, which is one of our programs that engages students in impact focused education. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about solving problems that matter and how to get going on, on pursuing impact focused careers yourselves. All right? So let's start with uh, some larger global trends. These are things that most of you probably know of, so think of this as a good, quick primer. We know that working age populations are shrinking in wealthy countries. The global economy is shifting. We'll talk about that soon. Technology is accelerating, but it's also causing discontinuities. Governing is getting harder across the world. The nature of conflict is changing and leading to a lot of direct and indirect implications of global magnitude. And of course, there's the elephant in the room, climate change, that is, that is imperiling uh, our existence, to be perfectly honest. So let's go deeper into a couple of these topics, like the rapid demographic change. So actually, much earlier than 2045, India is going to take over as the, as, the, as the country with the highest population, right? And for the next 60, 70 years, India is going to stay right on top in terms of its population. Right now, one in five people under the age of 20, okay? One in five people under the age of 20 live in India. And then you have China, Nigeria, the US, Indonesia, but look how we have three African countries, Nigeria, Congo, and Ethiopia, making that list of the top 10 largest uh, countries with the largest population. What is the actual real size of Africa? So if you actually put, if you take China, India, US, Eastern Europe, and then Spain, France, Germany, three of the largest uh, European countries, and put them all together, that's how much room Africa occupies. So Africa is enormous, something we often forget. It is also one of the most gifted in terms of natural resources, but also one that has some of the largest challenges. By the end of the century, 40% of the people in the world will be African. In terms of the economy, by 2050, China will be the largest economy in the world, followed by India, US, and then Indonesia, Brazil, and a bunch of other countries, which are con currently considered middle-income countries or low-income countries. All right? So the global order is going to shift, and it's going to shift very quickly. And then there's the other elephant in the room, which is artificial intelligence and automation, and how is that going to affect our economy? So um, right now, about 47% of the jobs in the US are at risk from automation. That number is about 77% for China and 85%, 85% for Ethiopia, which is one of the largest African countries, right? So what are these jobs that might not exist? 
Most of them are boring, repetitive jobs, like preparing food and construction and cleaning and driving and labor. And I was kind of happy to see this because teaching was at the end of that list. So I feel like I made a good choice by staying in, the, staying in academia, right? But a lot of these jobs are going to be gone and they are not coming back. Climate change is very real. I hope we don't have any skeptics in the room here. It's, it's incredibly real. It's human-induced. There is enough evidence. That's not a debate anymore. And we are feeling its impacts every single day. Millions of people have been displaced due to weather-related events, a lot of them within their own countries, and a lot of them across countries. And Poland has been one of those countries that has been affected by the refugee crisis that emerges out of conflict, that emerges, that partly em uh, can be traced back to climate change. And if you don't take action, it's going to get significantly worse. One of the most direct impacts, and one that I have seen on a first-hand basis over the last few years, is the rates of undernourishment. So the number of people undernourished has actually increased over the last three years. About three years back, um, so I, 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 do a lot, I do a lot of work across the African continent. Right now, some of my projects are focused on, um, on Sierra Leone and also in Liberia. And a, a bag of rice in Liberia costs about uh, $25, costs about $25 right now. About three years back, it costed, it costed more like $12 to $13. So the cost of rice has almost doubled. And it's very common for people to spend up to 60% of their income on food alone on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And those 40% so of the kids in Sierra Leone are stunted. And those numbers continue to climb. And you can trace it right back to climate change. So we have a lot of global challenges with local manifestations, um, but this is also a special moment in history. We have age-old challenges like poverty, ignorance, disease, addiction, violence, and tyranny, and then we have new and unprecedented challenges like the environmental crisis, cyber warfare, the threat of nuclear and chemical warfare. So we have all these challenges, but we have also come a long way and we've made progress on a number of fronts. How did that come about? A lot of different contributors. And if you go back and talk about automation, here are four qualities that humans have that are harder to let machines take over. We have empathy, creativity, communication, and collaboration. And at least for the time being, at least for the time being, I believe that we are safe from, from having machines learn empathy. 10 years from now, who knows? And that empathy, creativity, communication, collaboration has let us bring down the infant mortality rate significantly, significantly down from 44%. Can you imagine that? Half the kids died before they turned five years old, and now that number is down to 4%. And most of that is in, is in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, right? That's, that's tremendous progress, and we've, we've accomplished that. Extreme poverty from 1800 uh, to today, it's fallen from 85 to 9%. That is phenomenal. Life expectancy, life expectancy has gone up over the years. Literacy has also gone up significantly from 10% to 86%. Right? And it keeps climbing slowly but steadily. So talking about literacy, talking about education, uh, Together, we've collaborated, we've addressed some of these challenges through various innovative means. At Lehigh University, we believe that we are here to prepare students for a life of impact. And, we think about, and when we think about impact, it's impact, in the, it's impact in the world, it's impact in terms of, of improving and advancing the human condition, but also impact in terms of finding their place in the world. How many of you are familiar with the concept of ikigai? Some of you? Wonderful. So it's a beautiful Japanese concept. It's the, the idea here is to find this intersection between what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for. In other words, find this intersection between your passion, mission, profession, and vocation. And so we have a number of programs that help students find that ikigai, find that reason for being. So before we talk a little bit about how we do and we talk about one of the programs, uh, let's talk about three assumptions that have driven the higher education system over the last few decades. 
the first assumption is this idea that someone needs to teach for someone else to learn. And so the traditional thinking for, of the professor is the keeper of knowledge, is the sage on the stage that's going to impart knowledge to these students who are all going to open their minds and accept it all in. But we know that's not true. That's changing because students learn from a lot of different places. By the way, A New Culture of Learning is an excellent book. It's really thin, just the kind of book I like to read. And I would, uh, you can read it in an afternoon, and I would strongly recommend it. But students learn from a lot of places. Everybody here is familiar with the Khan Academy. Yes? Coursera and Udacity. How many of you have heard of the peer-to-peer -peer university? Or 42, which is a tuition-free coding university with two branches, one in California, one in France, and they have no professors. It's all based on peer-to-peer -peer learning, and when students come out of these programs, they are just as good. So does it mean that we don't need professors? We absolutely do, but the role of the professor is changing from being the sage on the stage to being the guide on the side. That helps students learn, and more importantly, learn how to learn. All right? So that's the first assumption. The second is this idea that universities prepare students for industry. And that probably came around after the Industrial Revolution where the universities were built to prepare students for this kid to power this capitalist engine that kept students who would keep going you know, and become workers. Right? So I spent uh, about three years back, I spent uh, three years uh, studying non-traditional career pathways, focused on social innovation and global sustainable development. I talked to over 300 people that worked on all kinds of challenges from global health to clean energy to uh, human rights to education, but they all believed in the power of science, technology, and innovation to improve the human condition. Right? And I put together a book called Solving Problems That Matter and Getting Paid For It. And if you go to ResearchGate, I, I assume some of you know about ResearchGate, it's a, it's a social network for researchers. You can actually download the PDF of the book, and I can also make it available to Powell if there's an easier way to disseminate it to all of you, right? But the assumption is that universities prepare students for industry, but that's not true because we prepare students for a wide array of organizations. A lot of our students, a lot of our engineers and scientists who work in nonprofits, they end up in academia, they work in startups and social enterprises, they work for multilateral organizations like the United Nations agencies, they work as consultants, they work in the government, they work in the rising fourth sector, like the B Corps, like the L3Cs, all these organizations that bridge that gap between being for profit or not for profit because they are all for good. Right? A lot, of our, a lot of our graduates work in the gig economy. So I don't have numbers for Europe, but last year in the US, 42 million Americans signed a 1099, which is a form you sign when, you get it, when you're getting income on an ad hoc basis. One in three millennials, one in three millennials did some kind of a gig, whether that is uh, freelancing on Odesk or uh, letting out a room on Airbnb or driving Uber or whatever it is. All right? So the gig economy is getting more and more pronounced. Yes, there are lots of issues, but that's not what we're talking about. This is happening. You like it or don't. Right? Our parents' generation, typically, like my dad, has had probably two or three distinct jobs over his 40-year career. The average graduate graduating now is going to have 12 to 15 distinct careers or distinct jobs over their 40-year working life. So the question for academia becomes, or the question for professionals becomes, how do you prepare yourself, not just for your first job or second job, but for a lot of different jobs that you're going to take on one after another, and you constantly have to keep learning? All right? And we'll talk about that in a bit. The third assumption, the somewhat controversial one, and I always get into trouble for this one, is this idea that you need to know the basics to do more advanced work. And so our educational systems are based on a very incremental model where you learn like physics 1, 2, 3, 4, and math like 1 to 30, and at some point you might learn something that is directly applicable. But the problem is that the problem is that the rate at which we can learn just can't keep up with the rate at which we are creating new knowledge. So we are always going to stay behind unless we learn some basics and then go at the other side of the spectrum and go top down. Start with larger problems, start with larger challenges. So my way of thinking is to do first, learn later. I don't want to learn about random things that are not going to help me solve problems that I care about. 
So my way of thinking is, let's start, let's start thinking about what do we really deeply care about? Is it food security, global health, human rights, you know, making, our, making our food systems more circular, whatever it is. What is that problem that we truly deeply care about? Let's start learning about it. Let's learn everything we can learn. Let's, let's, be, let's be very humble. Let's, let's find others that share a passion for that topic and let's learn from them. Let's learn with them and reach that point of intellectual maturity. Let's reach that point of optimal ignorance where you're ready to contribute to the solution. All right? And then get going, solve problems. Whether you know something or you don't know something isn't, is, is irrelevant if you're actually solving the problem. All right? So when we think about education and the future of education, we talk a lot about a mindset-driven education. I assume everybody here is familiar with the construct of mindset. If not, you absolutely have to do this. There's a brilliant little book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. Again, a book you can read in less than a day. And I would strongly urge you to read that book. It's called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And she talks about a fixed mindset where we think that we know everything we can learn, or we have a growth mindset where we are always looking to learn new things. And the idea is that if you have a growth mindset, and if you cultivate a growth mindset, because it can be cultivated, then you can learn whatever it is you need to learn to solve a problem. So skill sets, mindsets, and portfolios of accomplishment go hand in hand. Mindsets are about believing and thinking. Skill sets are about learning and applying. And the proof is in the pudding. So our portfolios demonstrate what we have accomplished and how we've put those skill sets and mindsets into action. And they further, and they further, it's like uh, Lukash, my friend, uh, described this as a spiral. And we are always getting better at developing our skill sets, mindsets, and portfolios. Right? And collectively, collectively, they help us develop a new identity, develop our agency, develop our sense of self-efficacy, where we are ready to solve problems, we are ready to take on the world. It helps us reach a higher level of consciousness. But most importantly, but most importantly, they help us find our purpose and belonging in the world. And when I look at young people or, or even mid-career professionals, the thing that is often missing is this deep sense of purpose. Why do I exist? What can I do to contribute to society? We are lacking that, and this is a way to start developing those mindsets. All right? So when I think about skill sets, what am I talking about? These are things like complex problem solving and critical thinking and creativity and coordinating with others and emotional intelligence based on the foundational skills of teamwork and communications. And by the way, this was a, a, a framework developed by the World Economic Forum called the 2020 Skill Sets, and they keep updating it every year. But frankly, it's, it comes down to these 10 skill sets. And these are relevant. These are relevant no matter what you do whether you are a musician or a baker or an engineer or a UX designer or a Java programmer or a C-sharp programmer or whatever. These are relevant to you, right? When we talk of mindsets, these are things like a creative inquiry-led approach where you're not afraid to ask good questions, pursue new intellectual pathways. These are things like design thinking without some of the, without some of the, the post-it note bullshit, but that's a topic for another day. Right? It's things like entrepreneurial thinking, systems thinking, being able to see the trees and the forest, a data-driven approach, an evidence-based approach, a global perspective, being able to envision the future, envision uh, some kind of higher sustainable equilibrium. If you can dream it, you can do it. It's about coalition building. It's, the, it's about the ability to make good, sound, ethical decisions, to take the lead and play by strengths, and most importantly, most importantly, it's about execution. It's about getting stuff done. The difference between doing something 99% and 100% is not 1%. The difference is 100%. Something is done or something is not done. And if you think of it, that's a mindset. There are some people who do it incredibly well and do it to the very end, and others don't. How do you cultivate that mindset is the question. Right? And if you develop these mindsets, you can develop whatever specific skill set you need to, to solve a problem. And then we talk about portfolios and all your different experiences and the kind of work you have done. But in terms of its outcomes, how have these, how have these experiences and your portfolio helped you grow as a person? How have you advanced knowledge? How have you advanced praxis? What kind of professional recognition have you got? And the sum total 
of these skill sets, mindsets, and portfolios is what we seek to deliver. So the question is, how do you develop these kinds of skill sets, mindsets, and portfolios? And the answer is by most certainly not doing that and taking more exams, right? Colossal waste of time. Even larger colossal waste of time is when you take simple problems. Everybody knows what that is, a Rube Goldberg machine? Yeah? That's such, I look at that, I'm like, what a waste of time. What a waste of time. Why would you do that? Why would you take a simple problem and make it incredibly more complex when there are so many incredibly real, incredibly real challenges out there in search of simple solutions? So why not? Why not spend our limited time, money, energy on solving simple prob or solving complex problems with simple solutions, right? So from our perspective, uh, we believe that it's all about engaging students, professionals, I mean, mid-career professionals, everybody in real, meaningful, authentic projects, all right? And I'll get a, just a little bit into the details, but let me make it very clear. This is not just about students. This is about everybody, because as I said earlier, we have to keep learning for life, all right? So we run a number of programs. One of it is it's called the Mountaintop Summer Experience. That's our beautiful space on one of our campuses on top of a mountain that used to be the research headquarters of Bethlehem Steel, which in its heyday was the second largest steel company in the world. And so they went bankrupt, we got this space, and now that is kind of our epicenter for creative inquiry and impact-focused work. And so we fund teams. Uh, these are all multi-year projects, and they work on all kinds of challenges and all kinds of topics like making 3D printed concrete. Uh, we had a team last summer that figured out how to convert uh, drywalls, thousands of tons of which ends up in landfills, and they figured out how to convert this drywall into fertilizer. Right? Think about it. That's an absolute game changer. Um, we have a team right now that is uh, uh, educating people about mass incarceration through social theater. We have teams that are working, are developing like VR uh, games and VR-based uh, programming to educate students in middle schools about the watershed. So right now we have more than 30 projects in this whole ecosystem. They are all pursuing something fundamentally novel, something that can fundamentally uh, disrupt the way we do things in some specific context. A lot of these projects, so another one is, uh, is, uh, is, about, is around parklets. And so how do you take a single parking spot and convert that into some way, some form of bringing people together and engaging them in, in activities that improve walkability, that support local businesses, and make the places more inviting? And so we have students designing parklets uh, that cost about $200 to $300 each, which is a radical shift from the $40 to $50,000 parklets that have been installed in San Francisco and Philadelphia. Right? So there is something fundamentally creative about all these different projects. And then a number of these projects are in the global space, and they're focused on global social impact. So that gets me to the third part of my talk, where I'm going to uh, show you a 10-minute uh, video clip that captures some of our work in Sierra Leone. And then I'm going to share with you some of the lessons learned uh, from working in these contexts. Global Social Impact Fellowship is an opportunity for students to come together, collaborate, and work on some of the most complex challenges facing low- and middle-income countries. They are all multi-year ventures, with one team passing the baton onto the next team semester after semester until they have a spectacular failure or, a, or an amazing success. And that's really critical because a lot of the challenges that we are working on are not things that we can truly understand find ways to engage, develop practical solutions, and actually implement them in the course of a semester or a year. We need to do, <laughs> we need to do a data collection process for the PhDs also. So I'm a member of the Ukuleli Test Trips team, and our venture project is focused on lowering maternal mortality rate in Sierra Leone. Well, Sierra Leone has been one of the poorest um, in West Africa. There have been high rates of poverty in all regions. 
The test strips are a specific affordable and accessible technology. They have free parameters, leukocytes, nitrites, and protein, and this will screen for both UTIs and preeclampsia, which are things that can endanger a pregnancy, especially in rural settings. These are conditions that are easily treatable and manageable in other countries like uh, the U.S. and women should not be dying from them or if they don't die from them they should not be ha having a reduced quality of life from these easily treatable and manageable conditions. This type of project is like nothing else that I have ever encountered at Lehigh. It's an amazing opportunity to tie in everything that I have learned. I get to do research, I get the lab experience, and then it also has real-world impact. So I'm on the sickle cell anemia project. So basically we're designing a low-cost, easy-to-use sickle cell anemia diagnostic device, and we want to eventually implement it in Sierra Leone and throughout other low-middle-income countries. I think it just brings our research to the next level. Not only are we developing the device, but we have the control and we have basically the power. Um, it's all up to us for it to be implemented. I think at least with our project, like having that long-term goal, um, everyone on the project is so excited about it that we all put in, you know, just way more time than is required because everyone's just genuinely excited about it. And it's also just nice knowing that what you're doing has the potential to actually make a difference. <laughs> great experience. I've had an opportunity to work on a few different research teams at Lehigh, but doing uh, the GSIF program has really been the best research I've been able to do. It's been hands-on when needed, but we've also had a lot of freedom to kind of do and work on what we think is the most important part. I'm on the malnutrition team. It's a group of seven students that's looking to uh, address malnutrition in Sierra Leone. I'm a bioengineering major, so a lot of the stuff that we do in the classroom is quantitative, like numbers, stuff like that. Um, and it's really hard to see how it would translate uh, when you're kind of just staring at formulas and coding and stuff like that. Once you see like how it can translate, at least for me at least, like it opens like a lot of things like what I want to do for my future, what avenues I want to take, and those are things that I wouldn't have realized I could pursue. It gives you sort of a greater sense of like what you can do as a person. It gives you like a more connected sense also. Take, see the scoop? Can you grab, like, use it to pick up a few things? Yeah. And then we call ourselves the Mushroom Team, and our goal is to create socially conscious, sustainable uh, business venture here in Sierra Leone. Currently, almost a half the labor force in Sierra Leone works in rice farming, and so a very good portion of the year, there's really actually not very much food around and so mushrooms are an alternative where you could actually grow mushrooms year round and uh, there actually are no mushrooms commercially grown in Sierra Leone so really be introducing a new market which is pretty exciting. Obviously the project can have a much far reaching impact than what we've done so far but even just on an individual level with the people that I've met I can actually if our project's successful provide jobs for them for a really long time and that's really an amazing feeling, like to change the livelihood of what someone you consider to be a friend it is really not an opportunity you have doing anything else. This is actually going to a place where you are actually trying to make things that could change actually the life of many, many people. That part of the experience, if, if we are actually able to do that, that is something so rewarding. So the project is assessing the socioeconomic factors underlying Ebola infection. The two professors we're working with currently have a computational model that can accurately predict in real time and space the density of Ebola infected bats. We were really surprised just the energy and how great our translators were. I think if we were to go find them on our own, we would never be able to find ones that were as effective as ours. I think having the connections to be able to go into the village and do surveys is really important. 
Lee has a formal memorandum of understanding with World Hope, and uh, this is a partnership that really enables the Global Social Impact Fellowship because for all the projects we serve as the intellectual partners, while World Hope serves as the operational partner, so World Hope has a very entrepreneurial mindset and so do we. So they have been challenging the status quo and trying to pivot from traditional aid-based approaches to trade-based approaches. And that aligns perfectly with the social entrepreneurial approach uh, that is emphasized in the, in the GSIF. Sustainability is one of the key aspects in human development. If you want to, you, if you want to change and impact life, you should be able to train and empower people to be sustainable community. Students today want to have impact. They are thinking beyond themselves, you know, they want to influence other lives, they want to have positive social change in the world immediately around them and, and beyond. I think if you have a heart, you know that it's, it's essential to moving the world forward, moving, and by moving the world forward, I mean moving everyone forward together. I shouldn't only be concerned about myself, you know, this isn't my world and everyone else lives in it. You know, I live in this world just as everyone else. I'm in the Safe Motherhood team and we're making a documentary series on maternal health because Sierra Leone has the highest maternal mortality rate. So we are trying to figure out the causes of that and what steps have been taken and how the community is handling that. The story has become more real for me being here because it has a face and it has a voice. All the research that went into it was eye-opening and important, but actually being here, it gives the story a personality, and I think that's what's going to draw people in and, and make them care about the issue. I have learned something new every time I've left this office, <laughs> um, whether it's like riding in the back of the truck with the Safe Motherhood team to all of the clinics, just getting to watch what their process is. It's impressive. It's like a beautiful thing to get to see everyone just doing separate independent things, but all for the same goal. We just want to make powerful change. Everyone is invested in each other's work. When the mushroom team grew their first batch of mushrooms, I was ecstatic. I was taking pictures of it. And we all have a vested interest in making sure each other succeed. It's a lot of learning and a lot of growing really, really fast. It's a lot of personal development. It's a lot of seeing yourself in new and different ways. It's a lot of seeing how you fit into a larger context, into a global context. Every single student is passionate about something. And part of our job here is to help them find what it is that they're really passionate about. What keeps them up at night? What is it that they're willing to give up a lifetime for? And that's where we're looking for alignment between those deep personal passions and real challenges in the world. I think this program is really unique in that this one is fundamentally about creating tangible change. And whether that's through saving the lives of women directly by providing the means to test themselves for infections or diseases, to raising consciousness and trying to create cultural change, all of it is tangible. We are all about creating new stuff, creating new movies and documentaries and technologies and businesses and policies and drug delivery mechanisms and what have you, right? So we want students to create stuff and when students create stuff, they learn best. So uh, let's talk about some of the fundamentals of how this works and how we, how we identify problems and how we work on it. So first of all, every single project is interdisciplinary. They, we, I can't imagine a bunch of engineers sitting around the room and trying to figure out how to address these really complex challenges. We have several partners on the ground, so we work very closely with various nonprofits, like in Sierra Leone, we are working with, uh, with a nonprofit called World Hope International. We work very closely with uh, UNICEF, 
We work with uh, the healthcare system by itself. So all the stuff we do actually has to be approved by the, the chief medical officer of the country. And so we are always in touch with them and we're going back and forth to identify the right things to work on. It's 24 seven nonstop action and the students have to take very radical ownership in these projects and so do the faculty. So this cannot be like a thing you do on the side. From my perspective, we have three goals, impact, impact and impact. This is the purpose of your life. If it, the impact is what matters first, the publications and how we inspire others comes next. And in that journey, if you learn something, wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. But it's really focused on that impact and that radical ownership is crucial to make that happen. First do, then learn. Because then you learn why it is, why you need to learn something. We, we don't talk a lot about problems, we talk about opportunities, right? So uh, maternal health is a tremendous challenge. That's the larger issue we are trying to address. But the test strips that they use to diagnose women right now cost about $2 each, and that presents an opportunity because now two of the major contributors, uh, preeclampsia and urinary tract infections, can be screened earlier. You can screen women early and often in their communities, in the comfort and privacy of their homes. And so that was an opportunity we identified. We developed a two cent test strip, and then we designed a whole bunch of things around it. And in fact, just last month, we got regulatory approval for our device in Sierra Leone, and now we are developing a strategy working very, very closely with the health ministry to get this test strip into the hands of community health worker across half the country, okay? so. Is, is this going to address all the contributors to high maternal mortality rates? Most certainly not, but it makes a dent. And a, a, a number of such innovations together over time can really address the issue in a significant manner. Right? So we focus much more on specific opportunities that we, we believe we can find the resources to, for, to address those and reach some kind of a higher equilibrium. It's all about outcomes and not about activities. Um, we don't need heroes. Our, our goal is actually self-obsolescence. So for example, one of our most successful venture was um, a low-cost greenhouse. And we started working on that in 2010. And over eight years, uh, we had designed these greenhouses. And we had commercialized them in Kenya, Cameroon, Sierra Leone, Mozambique, and a bunch of other countries. So now we had eight companies all run by locals, okay? All run by locals, and we help them go from you know, dev the technology to access to capital to what happens when it breaks, who's gonna fix it, to getting market linkages, the whole nine yards. And then we got out of it, and they were running it. We, uh, we had a similar venture in, in Cambodia uh, where we were doing mushroom farming, and last year uh, we uh, did about $800,000 in revenues which is a lot of money in Cambodia. So we have over 250 farmers that collectively produce about 6,000 kilos of straw mushrooms on a weekly basis. That technology was designed by a sophomore at, uh, at my university. All right, and now it's really scaled up. We don't get a penny of it, we're not the heroes. Our farmers, most of whom are women, are the heroes and they have the system running. So our job is to just get stuff done, get out, and create an independent, self-sustaining system. And to do that, you can't focus on your product alone. You have to design the entire ecosystem. So we just didn't design this two cent test strip and say, this is it, we're done. We actually got a, a grant from the, the Canadian Development Agency. In other words, we not only go after American taxpayers, we also go after Canadian taxpayers. And uh, we use this grant to study various distribution pathways to see how we can get this test strip to remote geographically dispersed areas. We, we designed educational programming for the community health workers and other stakeholders. So there are probably more than 40 different artifacts that we designed to make, to create this whole new system. And so when you're, when you're engaged in disruptive innovation, you can't be thinking about your product alone. You have to think about that entire ecosystem and the entire ensemble of everything you need to design, validate, refine iteratively over and over again until you have something that works. Uh, no volunteers, uh, only professionals. So we don't take volunteers in our programs. We work with a lot of external people who are professionals in various areas, but there's a very clear business models and nothing that is on, on, on a short-term basis. Uh, it's all about convergence and not silos. Uh, so everybody's, uh, we create a space where everybody's thoughts, inputs, suggestions are very welcome. And uh, we try all kinds of things to find scalable solutions. So in other words, we do not work with communities. Well, we do work with communities, but the larger goal is not to empower a specific community. 
It's not about service. It's about working with markets and working with systems. And that's where we source the kinds of problems we work on. So all of these problems, we are not trying to empower a certain community. We're trying to get our test strips across the country. The sickle cell diagnostic device, again, we're building a coalition to make it easier to screen and treat kids for sickle cell trait. In, in, the, in the Philippines, uh, which is another ecosystem, uh, we are working on plastics recycling with a lot of different stakeholders to create a whole network of community-scale plastics recycling facilities. So it's all about market-centric approaches. It's about rigor and evidence, not just passion. It's about execution. Ideas are worthless, right? It's all about execution. Your idea is not going to solve the problem. Your technology alone is not going to solve the problem. That's 5%. The other 95% is creating demand. It's supply chains, accountability metrics. It's all kinds of other things that are necessary to get your venture to work. It's all about execution. It's about long-term engagement, as I said. So the, typically, we pick up projects with a three to five year horizon. Sometimes it's like seven to nine years. Uh, we don't do one semester, two semester, or one or two year projects. These are all ambitious projects. And if we fail, that's OK. If we feel, if we feel that we are not making much progress, we'll pull the plug. But maybe, just maybe, we'll actually do something significant that makes a dent, right? So we are totally against any kind of episodic short-term engagement. And that emerges, that happens only when you have strong relationships. So we don't have a project and then we, we try to build relationships. It's, it's the exact opposite. We have a number of relationships and the projects emerge from those relationships. And we launch careers, not jobs. So a lot of our students now, they work for the State Department. They work for Clinton Global. They actually are professors teaching this at, at several universities. So our focus here is to change the perception of engineering, the perception of education, uh, to caregiving, to social impact. That's the, whole, that's the holy grail for a university, and that's what we seek to do. And that gets me to the last part of my, of my talk, which is about solving problems that matter and finding, uh, finding these kinds, or build, not finding, but building impact-focused careers. And so this is a question I get all the time, all the time from mid-career professionals, sometimes from late-career professionals, and a lot from students as well which is that you know, what, 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 uh, what I really, really enjoy doing, what I want to do when I grow up, uh, does not pay money. And what pays the money is so boring. I don't see the connection to the world at large. I don't see a connection to who I am and the kind of impact I want to have. So what can I do next? How do I solve problems that matter? And how do I also get paid for it? And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, I talked to a lot of professionals. I got a lot of insights. And uh, I'm going to share five of them with you. The first is this idea that it takes a planet. And by default, people associate social impact uh, with nonprofits, right? So you think nonprofits and social impact are synonymous. And maybe, in some respects, that's OK to think, to think that way. But you have a lot of wonderful nonprofits. And then you also have a not very wonderful nonprofit, not profits, right? You have food banks that actually uh, create dependency. You have nonprofits, like you go to you go to Kibera in Nairobi in Kenya, and there are like a hundred nonprofits around this in enormous slum, and they have figured out how to make themselves sustainable. Their goal is probably not self-obsolescence. So there are good nonprofits and there are bad nonprofits. There are nonprofits that are changing the world for people who do not want their world to be changed, right? Um, you have large companies, and you know people love criticizing large companies. But you've got to realize that large companies also create a tremendous amount of social value. You know, Intel has 100,000 employees; those are 100,000 paid jobs, and a lot. Of, and they also give put money into various nonprofit organizations. They are put; they've invested millions of dollars to close the digital divide between men and women in the US and in developing countries. Uh, they create the chips that go into my phones. And frankly, I don't know if I could do any of my work if I didn't have a phone, if I didn't have access to an airplane, and I guess an air ride, or I didn't have access to a lot of other simple technologies that let me do what I do. So there are good nonprofits. Sorry, there are, there are good large corporations. And there are probably some bad large corporations. Right? The same applies to uh, governments. I'm actually not a fond of governments of any form at all, but guess what? You need them. And you can be really critical of the Chinese government, but you might also want to give them credit for bringing 87 million people out of poverty between 2000 and 2010. Right? That is spectacular. That is spectacular, and you have to give them credit for it. Maybe they did do something right that pulled those many millions out of extreme hunger and poverty. Social enterprises are not a panacea. 
I'm all about social enterprise. I've built more than 20 social enterprises which are all successful and have a life of their own outside of academia. Uh, there are things like microfinance that have been absolutely transformative in India and Bangladesh, but they have not worked in Sierra Leone and Liberia. There are social enterprises like the Urban Eye Hospital in southern India that have absolutely transformed eye care and reduced needless blindness. It took them 40 years, 40, 40 years to build up that social enterprise. Right? So you need social enterprises, you need, and you need UN agencies. You can criticize the UN agencies all you want, but it's only because of the UNHCR and other agencies that, uh, that millions of refugees are alive today. Right? So what's the point? The point is that there are good governments and there are evil nonprofits. There are good corporations or corporations doing good things and doing bad things. It all depends, and you have to actually go into the evidence and look at, look at what, ha what are they actually doing. And all those organizations need smart people, like all of you, to be a part of their organization to create value. Right? It really takes a planet. So social innovation and social impact doesn't happen just through nonprofits. We need folks like to work for all kinds of organizations. How do you find those organizations? And how do you figure out what's the right one for you? And that would be made a little easier if you would start asking the right question. But we often ask the wrong question. The question we ask is, what organization do I want to work for? Or what are my skills and how, where do I kind of employ them? So instead of thinking about what organization do I want to work for, what if you think about what problems do I really, really want to solve? What am I passionate about? What am I willing to make sacrifices for? What, keep, what keeps me up at night? What problems do I really want to solve? And what is the best platform with the, with the, with the optimal resources and networks to solve that problem, right? And if you do that, you can start winnowing through the platforms you have access to. But there are lots of different kinds of organizations and lots of platforms. So here are three ways in which you can start winnowing down the kind of platforms that would work for you. The first one, and the most important one, one probably, is what is your preferred engagement approach? What does that mean? You can address a problem through policy approaches, through, by developing new technologies, through a market-centric approach, through, through advocacy, through activism. And you have to figure out which one aligns best with your way of working and thinking. So I'm all about technology-based, market-centric approaches, but the whole idea of activism just doesn't appeal to me. That's not who I am. That's not something I feel good about. It's still an important way of making change. So think about what's your preferred engagement approach. The second question is, do you like to work with systems or do you like to work with people? So you can address a challenge, say, improving resiliency of vulnerable communities, maybe with better outcomes identified like Tom inspired us to do this morning. Right? And you can work at the national level designing larger strategies and designing systems, or you can work on the ground with people and you can see the human impact of your work. But that impact is constrained to a smaller population. On the other side of the spectrum, you're working with the larger system and you can have significantly more impact, but you might not see it or it might never happen or it might happen over a very long time period. So do you like to work with systems or do you like to work with people? What's your preferred work culture? You'll be amazed. All those people I talked to, this was actually one of the major reasons why they worked for some organization and not others. Are you willing to work in a place where you're required to wear a suit, or a suit and tie every day? Or do you want to work in your, in your jeans and uh, t-shirt? Do, like do you want a 24-7 job? Do you want a 9-5 to -five job? Do you want to be in a hierarchical culture where you know exactly what your role is and where you fit in what you're supposed to do? Or do you want to work in kind of a round table startup environment where everybody does whatever is needed to be done? Right? These are choices you're making to figure out what work culture you would fit best in. So think about these and then think about uh, which ones are left and then test drive those many different platforms. How do you get your foot in the door? It's all about the quality of your work and the strength of your relationships. Because a lot of careers in this space are either built up by people themselves or they, they find them through the network. They are not typically advertised like you do in industry. All right? So it's all about your portfolio. And your portfolio of what you have done before, whether it's relevant to uh, impact-focused fo impact work or not, needs to not just show passion, but also demonstrate or provide some evidence of what you have accomplished. It needs to focus on experiences, but more importantly, it needs to focus on impacts that you have had in the past. So don't just send pictures or include pictures of you with cute little kids somewhere in the world, right? That's not what you do. What you do is say, all right, 
Here is one of our projects. We started uh, an, an initiative in Katowice that's trying to address this issue of homelessness. I don't know if that's a real issue, but in Krakow, homelessness is an issue, and we tried to address this, and over the last three years, through this innovation, this, these are the impacts that we've had provide evidence and, and leverage evidence-based approaches, and that's a way to build up your network and get a foot in the door. But the question is, if you get your foot in the door, will you, will you feel complete? Will you make enough money? Will you be able to survive? And the answer is actually yes. At least looking at this from the US-centric but global perspective, uh, it can actually be pretty decent. So the 300 people I interviewed, their salaries range from $30,000 a year to about $300,000 a year. The median, the median was about $80,000, which is wonderful, right? It tells me that I can actually you know, do things that I truly deeply care about that align with my values and my passions, and I don't have to you know, live a life of eating ramen noodles. I can drink good wine, I can go on vacations, I, I feel complete, and I can reach this space where I'm not always thinking about I'm not always thinking about where the next you know, paycheck is going to come from, right? So it can be lucrative. And that gets me to my last point, which is uh, I, asked, I asked these 300 people, so if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Or what, do you have any regrets? And you know, big picture, people had no regrets. They were incredibly, well, mostly happy about what they were doing. But they, by probing further, they came up with this one idea over and over again. And it was this idea that you're always in the real world. And people talked about how when they were, you know, some people jumped in when they were in their 20s. Some actually waited till they were in their early 50s to jump in the impact space. And, um, and they said, you know, we wish we had not made so many assumptions of, about who I am, what I can do, what I cannot do, and how do I get to these kinds of positions and these kinds of careers. Because those assumptions became my prison. And it took me a while to break out of it. So get going. You're always in the real world. You've always been in the real world. You don't have just one identity. I'm a professor, I'm an administrator, I'm an engineer, I'm a social entrepreneur, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm, a, uh, I'm an artist. I have so many different identities, and so do you. You're not just a developer. You're not just a UX designer or an engineer. So think about what are those other identities, and how, uh, can, what are those transferable skills, and how do you jump into this space? But the first question you should be asking yourself is why? Why do I care about impact, and why should I care about you know, impact, whether it's in Poland, in Europe, in, uh, in Africa, in any part of the world? Right? There are many different philosophies. There are as many philosophies as there are people. And um, you know, for some, it's about, uh, it's about saving others. Uh, it sounds horrible to me, to be perfectly honest, but if that's the way you think about it, uh, you know, I respect it. Um, you, want, you might want to empower others. You might want to help others. Uh, somewhat tricky construct, but that's still a good place to start. Your heart is in the right place. But I'll remind you something that Gustavo uh, uh, said. Gustavo, I forget his last name, talked about how he was, uh, he was associated with Paulo Freire, or Freire, who's a major uh, philosopher of education. And he talked about how if you come to help, don't come. But if you see your struggle as our struggle, come and let's live together for some time. And we might, work, and we might find something to work on together. That's a good way to look at it. I love two philosophies. One is the Ubuntu philosophy of I am because we are. We are fundamentally interconnected, and I, how can I be happy if you are sad? At a deeper level, maybe I like to think that I do this to satisfy my ego. And that's a good way, in my opinion, to look at it too. But I am because we are. And I'm going to, this is my last slide, I'm going to wrap up on, uh, on this, this brilliant uh, quote and uh, you know, philosophical framework uh, championed by Dr. Govindapa Venkatswami, who is the founder of the Arvind Eye Hospital, which I strongly urge you to look up because that's one of the world's foremost, foremost social enterprises in southern India. And uh, he talked about how when we grow in spiritual consciousness, we identify ourselves with all that is in the world. And there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping. It is ourselves we are healing. So find your why and get going and start getting stuff done. And, this, and the time to start is here and now.